All right. So thank you for joining us again for another Liberty Mutual Insurance Responsible Sports Hangout. My name is Matt. Today we're joined by Olympic gold medal winning coach Mike Candrea. He's currently the head coach at Arizona, and he's actually fresh with us just after practice. So thanks for joining us, Coach. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. We're also joined by the lucky winners of the Hangout with Responsible Sports and Coach Candrea uh, promotion. And we'll get to know a little bit about you, where you're from, and how you're involved with softball. And we'll start with you, Kenneth. Well, I'm Ken Costello, and I coach uh, for my daughter's softball team. It's been five years now since T-ball. I also coach soccer with my son. I'm also the president of our local fast pitch softball league, uh, the Mon County Girls Softball in Morgantown, West Virginia. And, and really, you know, I have a lot of interest in mostly how to effectively coach, instruct, and train girls in all age groups because I, you know, I feel this being the president of the association, wanting to be able to get everybody else that's a coach kind of on the same page and everybody working together, you know, and from a larger perspective, understanding how to promote and grow the sport that's softball and get it out to more girls, at least in our area. Now, it seems like you're extremely involved, Ken. Uh, Ruben, yeah, would you try. tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from and how you're involved with softball? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Ruben. Um, I've been coaching softball for my daughter since she was uh, six years old. Uh, she's been playing for about three, four years now. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Uh, right now, she's playing in a tenure division. She plays select and training the ball. So we're, we're we're real heavily in, in, enthralled into that, and it's an every weekend thing. So you know, the biggest thing you know I have questions about is just you know I guess how to bring her along for her age you know she she's a girl that you know she's really into this thing you know but uh she tends to be a little bit hard on herself sometimes <laughs> and uh, she's right here next to me as a matter of fact she's listening to this <laughs> so uh but yeah she's a, she's a good you know i just want to learn more about you know i played baseball all my life but if there's one thing that i've learned is that baseball and softball they're two different games i mean i know a lot of the fundamentals are the same but you know the the whole the whole the speed of the game and everything is just completely different. So you know I'm always just trying to learn new things. You know, and of course, try to learn from from someone you know who's had the type of success as Coach Kendrea, You know, and has been successful. You know, so I'm just trying to here to learn as much as I can, man. And, you know, take that to my daughter, her friends, and try to teach as much as I can. Right. Is, is that a Texas Longhorn? On your on your hat? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Hats down here. I did not out of war one for you. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Sharon. How you doing, Sharon? I'm doing just fine. I'm actually a head coach of Texas Elite Moreno in from Garland, Texas, and they're an 18 and under team. And I've actually been coaching since uh, my junior year in college. So, and and so, Coach, for our responsible sports fans at home who may not be as familiar with yourself, would you like to give uh, just a little background information? Well, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, grew up as a baseball player and got talked into going into women's softball. So I've been blessed for about the last 35 years of um, coaching fast pitch softball. But uh, got my start uh, as a junior college baseball coach, and um, – it's been a very blessed life for me, and I would agree with you. It's a different game um, for a lot of reasons, but uh, anytime you get a chance to, to work with young kids and uh, to see them grow, I used to think I coached kids for four years and they were gone, but I really coach them for a lifetime. They never leave me. So that's a unique part of coaching the female athlete, much more so than the male. Thanks. And we had Stephanie just join us. Stephanie, if you wouldn't mind. Just uh, let us know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you're involved with softball. And if you can't hear us, Stephanie, go ahead and check your speakers and microphone settings in the upper right-hand corner and make sure those are turned on. And we'll go ahead and get started with Kenneth. So, Kenneth, you have a question for Coach Andrea? Um, well, I, I, I think um, – Ruben had talked about some travel ball and stuff, and in most of my stuff, running the league is focused on rec ball, and you know there tends to be a little bit less pressure there. Though, then again, maybe not listening to some of the parents, but um, you know I still would like to see each player work hard. And you know my goal as a coach is always to try to have them be better at the end of the season than they were at the start of the season. And so, to me, that has a lot to do with motivation. So, my question kind of is, you know, how do you go about motivating players to excel? And, I mean, do you see, you 
always coach college ball, but I mean, mm -hmm. do you think there's a huge difference in the approach between collegiate Olympic players and, and rec ball players and how you're going to get motivate them to excel? Well, I think there's a difference even from the college level to the Olympic level uh, as far as the motivational factor. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because in today's world, um, kids, the recruiting has changed completely where now we're recruiting kids that are freshmen in high school and you wonder how can that kid ever know uh, what they need or what they're going to want to do four years from now. And the problem that I see with some of our kids is they wear the colors for three years and all of a sudden they get here and now they go to work and they've got to actually perform. And so it's kind of a culture shock for them. But for me, what I have found um, dealing with from the junior college level up is wh wherever I set the bar, um, kids will achieve it. And so I'm a big believer of setting the bar high, but – uh, on the other hand, um, I think one of our goals as a coach is to try to get them to become not only better players but better people. So I'm looking at the whole ball of wax. You know, um, the things that we do in our program, um, I think, have a big reflection on who this person is going to become somewhere down the road. And, you know, as long as you're coaching softball, the one thing you can realize right now is it's going to end someday. And so I think our job as coaches is to prepare them uh, to have the skills to be successful no matter what they do. And I think the softball field is a great um, great place to teach um, skills that are involved in the real world. You know, um, being a part of a team for some kids is a little different. Um, working hard. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I think um, as a coach, you have to set the tone and you have to raise the bar at your level I think one of the biggest things that I've found have been successful is, is having a meeting with your parents about what the expectations are in your program because I think you probably deal with parents a lot more than I do. Um, parents don't tend to call me up um, probably, but I think it's important that people understand, you know, what kind of program you're trying to run and what the structure is and what the goals are and what the responsibilities are for not only the kids but the parents. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Ruben, do you have a question for Coach Andrea? Um, something similar, I guess, uh, to what uh, the gentleman that just spoke before me, just kind of to touch up on it. Um, I ha You know, like I said, I, co I coach 10 new athletes, and I know it's, it's, it's very hard to, to get these kids sometimes to – to, to get motivated, you know what I mean, or just, or just not to be so hard on themselves, you know what I mean? I mean, the, the biggest thing I'm trying to preach to my daughter right now and, and to any of these kids at, at, at this age level is just to, you know, is just just not to make it such a big deal right now is like what I tell my daughter, you know what I mean? And uh, I, what approach would you take? I mean, I've heard from, from a – there's a high school coach that I talked to, and one thing he, he told me was, you know, girls got to feel good to play good. <laughs> you know, which is different from, from boys, you know what I mean? And uh, so w what recommendations would you have, you know, what kind of approach would you take with these girls, you know, j just to get them to just not put so much pressure on themselves? Well, the one thing you've got to think about is when you started playing the game or when I started playing the game, the game was fun, and that's why I played the game. You know, I yeah. enjoyed the competition, but I, I really enjoyed playing the game of baseball. And I played it for no, no other reason other than because I enjoyed the game. And I became a student of the game, and, and the better I got at the game, the more fun that I had. But I think the one thing that you have to stress with young kids, it's, this game is not life-threatening. You know, and what I will do here at Arizona is we have a cancer center right across the street from our field here, and the kid has a bad day. I may walk him right across the street and walk him through a – a ward of young kids that can't do what they do. So we try to keep it in perspective. And I think that's one of the things you have to think about is who is putting the pressure on that kid? Is it the kid putting pressure on themselves or is it parents putting pressure on the kid? And um, too many times I see parents having um, such high expectations in their kids that when they do bad in a the game, they don't only really get it. I mean, no kid wants to go out there and play bad, but they get in the car, and the first thing that they do is they get bombarded about their performance. So um, times have changed a little bit. And the one thing I look at is when I grew up, we played three sports. We played multiple sports. And today the one thing you're seeing 
is kids are, are trying to commit to one sport um, and they're getting burned out you know and so you've got to be very careful about why is that kid really playing and I have an old saying that when the the student arrives the teacher appears meaning that until the kid really wants to play that game and be good at it it's awfully hard for me to push them yeah. Thanks. Sharon, would you like to ask Coach Kendra your first question? Uh, sure. You spoke a little bit about the recruitment, that you were starting to look for a freshman now that you're starting that process. Now, what do you look out look for a, as an, a player outside of talent? Well, I think the big thing for me, you know, there's got to be a skill set that you have to have to play at this level. But my big thing is looking a little deeper into the, the kid and to the family and I want you know I'm, I'm gonna be I want the, everything I want the great athlete that's also a great person and, and the one thing that I do know that I keep very high is character because um, you know Tucson's a small big city it's a million people but it's a college town and the one unique thing about the experience here is that you're in the newspaper all the time and so the one thing that I want to make sure is that I bring in kids that not only represent themselves and their family but this community in the right way and so there's a lot more to just playing the game um, I've had great athletes that weren't good teammates and you know we play a team sport so I'm kinda looking for the whole package do they have a skill set do they understand what it's like to be a part of a team and do they encourage and are they the type of player that makes everyone around them better you know that's the kid that you want is the kid that that makes everyone better and I mean I've had some tough situations here where I've had great athletes that um, just didn't make good choices and the one thing you have to do as a coach is you have to kind of set the line as to how much you're gonna put up with and I remember leaving a kid um, in 19, 1997 we're getting to go to the College World Series I left an All-American pitcher at home because she made a bad decision and we ended up going there and winning the national championship without her which was really a, a, a shot heard around the world that, you know what, you never, you, you, you never um, give up on your morals and your beliefs to, for this game. And I think that's what happens sometimes is we want to win so bad that we're, we tend to put up with the attitudes that aren't really conducive to winning. And so you as a coach have to make a choice, and I think you, know, you have to have some rules and regulations on how you want kids to act and how you want them to react to situations. Hi, Stephanie. Can you hear us? Hi. Can you, you hear me? We can. How are you doing? I'm uh, before you ask your question, since you did join the Hangout a little bit later, we'd love to know a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you're involved with softball. Sure. Uh, my name's Stephanie Kim. I'm actually a 10U coach, just like Ruben said you were. Um, I coach a travel ball team out of Kansas City, Missouri. And our little organization has grown in the past year to three teams now. So we've got a couple of different age groups. And I'm uh, really excited to be on this call. Thanks a lot for letting me join in. Fantastic. And what was your first question for Coach Kendrea? Okay. So um, as I've been listening to some of the other questions, first of all, I'm very honored to be able to talk to you, Coach Kendrea. Thank you very much for um, hosting this. My question is, um, I've been around the game for a very long time, and I've noticed now that I'm coaching my daughter up, there are certain things out there that are so mechanically sound. All the little girls swing the same way. They run the same way. They look the same. And with my girls, I'm less of a recruiter and more of a builder. And so what my question is, is where do I draw the line between demanding mechanical perfection um, and just allowing them to be young ball players with that raw talent and the urge to just win and perform great. Well, that's a great question, and I think the you know the one thing I always look at. I'm very slow at making changes to athletes. You know, I'm looking for a good athlete. This game is built around fundamentals, and the thing that I would like to say to you is that as a coach, the best thing you can do is be a student of the game and know what is right and what is wrong because um, if they're not doing things correctly then obviously the mechanics become a big part of the game but truthfully 
you know, I want kids that enjoy the game and play the game and not, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat I've found over the years. You know, um, there's not always one way to do things and I don't want mechanical robots because mechanical robots um, will tend to get you beat anyway um, because they have a hard time adjusting to situations. You know, good athletes, you allow them to be good athletes and if they're performing great, um, at that level, I would find my biggest job would be to teach them how to play the game, okay? And I think fundamentals are a big part of it. But truthfully, I get a lot of kids here that the way things have changed today, kids play a lot more and practice a lot less. They play a heck of a lot of games and don't really practice. Therefore, I find myself teaching the simplest things, and that is the ability to play catch, which is the foundation of our game. And I'd like to see kids not play as many games because games don't mean anything to them. You know, they play so many darn games, and most of the games are time limits. Uh, most of them are for exposure. And I remember the old days when, you know, every tournament you played in, there was a winner and there was a loser. And if you got in that loser's bracket, you'd have to fight your way up, you know, through that loser's bracket. And those are the type of kids that I always wanted to recruit are the ones that could survive that because – if they can survive those ups and downs, the emotional roller coaster, then that's a big part of being successful at the higher levels. Great. Uh, we had a responsible sports fan named Josh left us a question on facebook.com backslash responsible sports, and he was wondering if you could just chime in a little bit on the differences between coaching at the Olympic level and coaching at the collegiate level. Well, I think the one thing that I would say um, is a huge difference. You know, at the Olympic level, you're dealing with the top of the pyramid. So they, they all have a very good skill set. Um, and the one thing that separates them, I feel, from the college athlete is their emotional stability. You know, if you look at an elite athlete, the one thing that they've learned to do, they have the whole package. So they, they understand what it takes physically to play the game. They understand mentally what it takes to play the game and prepare for the game. But they also understand the emotional part of the game. And the one thing that I was so – um, excited to watch was you never knew whether those kids at the Olympic level were practicing or playing, but they had the same look and the same energy and the same effort every day. So they were kind of unique and kind of different. I remember there were a time when I would practice with the uh, national team in the morning and then I'd have my college team in the afternoon. And I was finding myself really getting down on my college team because they couldn't do things quite as easily um, as the, the Olympians. But, you know, the Olympians aren't all superb athletes, but they're great competitors. And the one thing that I really enjoyed is watching our very best players play the game at 27 years old when they had the total package. And um, to me, I think that's the biggest difference. And that was one of the reasons why I chose the Navy SEALs to do some cross training with in 2004. I took them and we trained with the Navy SEALs and the one thing I wanted them to see is the, and I asked the commander of the SEALs, what separates the guys that make it and the guys that don't? He said, it's one thing, it's the emotional stability. They all have the physical talent, but when things get tough, some, some people crack and some people don't. And, you know, as an Olympian, you want those people that can embrace the uh, pressures of competition because you have a week and a half, you, you train for four years for a week and a half of competition and you got to put it all together at the right time. And the one thing you can't have is kids that can't handle the emotional roller coaster that the game puts you through. And so that's, I think, the biggest thing that I saw, uh, other than great hands and great eyes. <laughs> you know, the one thing about the Olympians, there wasn't one that did not have superb vision. And that's the reason why they were pretty good hitters. I, you know, I, I'm led to believe that the foundation for that emotional stability is obviously built through youth sports. Absolutely. Yeah, so, every um, one of them, you know, have been playing the game for a long time. But I think if I look back, they all played in organizations that were highly competitive, that did things the right way. And um, so the, kid, the kids were confident because they could perform the game at a high level. And that's the one thing I always talk about. You can't have confidence unless you can perform. So as a coach, the only way you're going to make your kids more confident is to help their performance get better. 
Ken, do you have another question for Coach Kendrea? Oh, um, sure. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, I guess it's kind of kind of a question. What's your uh, kind of perspective on face protection for fielders? I mean, in our league, we require first, third, and a pitcher to wear face guards defensively. And you know, I've seen other comments online where there seems to be this general kind of perspective that college coaches look down on players that want to wear those kinds of protective things and you know and, and and I look back you know a couple years ago I think it was 2011 when Claire Hossack fouled that ball off and Racy broke her eye socket and she didn't have a face guard on her batting helmet and it seems like you know a small protection goes a long way and I guess I was just interested in what your perspective is on face protection you know I don't have a problem with it. in fact um, you know when I started coaching softball um, we had catchers that didn't wear any um, shin guards you know, and I thought that was kind of crazy. Um, and I think today you look at the – everyone's wearing masks just about. You know, five years ago we had no one in our lineup wearing a mask on their helmets. But the kids that are we're getting now are growing up with that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I've seen a couple of situations where, um, you know, I'm, I, I thank the good Lord that they had the mask on because we've had a couple of concussions – from balls that have hit the bat into the, the face area. And so we take it pretty seriously. And I think at the younger age, safety has got to be a, a, a very first thing that you've got to look at. And um, uh, I know there's college coaches that are going to say, well, God, I don't want an infielder that has to wear a mask because they're probably scared of the ball. But there's, I think, a time and a place for everything. And if the kid can perform, I think it's just a matter of time. Five years from now, you're going to probably see more and more kids that may wear that protection, and it's going to be just kind of what it is, where right now it's kind of unique and kind of different. So it doesn't bother me. You know, if they can play the game, they can play the game. Thank you. Ruben, do you have another question for Coach? Yeah, uh, I have a kind of a two-part question. This goes with defense and offense, and this okay. goes just with – what I talked to you about that, you know, there's a difference between the, the baseball and the softball game. I noticed a lot of these swings from softball players, they look like an uppercut swing. Um, I don't know if, if that's what's taught, but a, a lot of these girls that I see, is, 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 it's almost what I call a softball swing, where it looks like a, a lot of these cuts are, are taken with an uppercut. I wanted to know your thoughts on that as well as on the defensive side. I've heard from a lot of uh, – gold coaches and high school coaches at colleges are preferring girls to come where or with what I was taught as a baseball player as a youth was to kind of receive ground balls as to where these girls are taught now an aggressive standpoint as to kind of scoop it up like shoveling it up. Yeah. So I just want to know your, your standpoint on, on both of those, you know. Okay. Well, let, let's start with the hitting because um, I came from a baseball background and um, – the one thing that you don't have to deal with in baseball is a rise ball, a ball that goes up. And so it is a little bit different um, hitting a softball. That's why Jenny Finch can go throw to uh, a Major League Baseball player and they can't hit the rise ball because they haven't seen it. And I yeah. think a lot of it is not so much that they can't hit it. It's just not in their database. Yeah. You know, if they saw it more and more, they'd be able to adjust to that. Um, so truthfully – if you look at a good swing, whether it's a baseball swing or a softball swing, there's some things that are identical. Um, you don't teach – I mean, not every baseball player has an uppercut. Um, there are certain things that every good hitter does. Everyone prepares differently, so their stance is different, right? Um, how they kind of get ready to get to the hitting position may be different. But once a hitter gets to the hitting position – the act of swinging, which is rotational, is pretty much the same because it's really the only efficient way you can move hit a moving object. So, I I mean, if you really want to look at some of that, there's a, a company called Right View Pro, um, RVP, um, that uh, does a very nice job of giving you models of softball players and baseball players that you can put side by side along with your daughter and you can kind of see the similarities yeah. that you have to have. Um, now, the difference for me is the hand positioning. Obviously, in baseball, you see a lot of low hands because the trajectory yeah. of the pitch is going down.
but in softball you'll see a lot more hands that are much higher and the reason being is it allows me to stay on top of the ball that's going up and I think that's the key is you know if your hands can't get above the ball you can't swing at it you know yeah uh, defensively I hope that answers your question yeah it does thank okay. you um, and there's some really good apps out right now man if you have an iPad you can there, there's coaches eye and um, dart fish um, 499 you can sit there and you can film your kid you know and you can kinda once you get the idea of what these key positions are you can really help expedite the learning process by understanding the swing and I think that would be a good place to start defensively I think the the one misnomer is that you still you still give with the long hop but you when you try to get a short hop you have to go get it you, you can't take a short hop and give with it because now it, you turn it into an in-between hop and so I think what you're seeing is kids taught to go get the short hop but if I have a nice long hop I can catch it like I'm catching an egg that yeah. has never changed and I think fielding the game's been around for a lot of years and I don't think there's anything you new and unique about fielding a ground ball um, you know I, I think it's sometimes the emphasis that we put on things and you see that all the time someone will go to a clinic they hear someone talk about maybe feeling short hops going get it so now they think everything that they feel they have to go get it no. you know, so some of it is mis, you know misinterpretation of good information and no. sometimes bad information is worse than no information you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. so you gotta be kinda careful that and that's why I really encourage coaches if there's one thing that you can do that's gonna help your players is you need to understand how to teach the game you need to understand how to teach throwing, how to teach fielding, how to teach hitting, you know, how to teach receiving, because if you don't, then I don't think we're doing our job with that kid to get them to enjoy the game because their skills don't get better. And then as they get higher up, the game gets quicker, and then it really starts kind of crumbling. Great. Thank you. Sharon, do you have another question for Coach Andrea? Yes. Um... Unfortunately, Arizona hasn't had their best season this year. You got and it. <laughs> you had to bring it up. <laughs> well, I can understand. <laughs> um, how do you control yourself with not getting upset and staying so calm? Because I've watched you on TV, yeah. and you're not getting, like, angry or anything. You're staying very calm and not, you know, freaking out like some people would do. How do you stay so calm? Well, I think, uh, you know, the one thing I've learned is either um, I'm going to control my emotions or my emotions are going to control me. You know, one of the things I learned a long time ago as a young coach, I used to get all riled up about a practice or something, and then I'd get them in a huddle, and I'd start yelling and screaming things. And then I, I had a 72-mile commute back home for a while. I used to commute 72 miles one way, so I had a lot of time to think. And there were so many days that I would say something to the team, and I'd be driving home, and I'd get about 20 miles down the road and say, well, why did I say that? That's not what I meant. So the one thing I try to do is I, I try to make sure that I think through things before I present things to my team. If I've got nothing good to say, I don't say anything, okay, or I say very little. Um, but I think part of that is um, understanding the situation that we're in right now. You know, we've got a very young team. Um, we've got one player that's in the same position as they were last year and we're going through some growing pains and those growing pains are very difficult because I haven't done it for 28 years I have not had to go through this but you know what I always say what doesn't kill kill you makes you stronger yes. and I think you have to keep reminding yourself that it is a game we can control only the things we have control over and my big thing right now is we're gonna to try to get better every day and keep working hard and I know that we have help along the way you know it's hard at this level to lose your number one pitcher um, for a year um, and we have our number one pitcher that is right now redshirting and so now we've relied on our number two three and four who are all new people number three and four are brand new to the program so it's growing pains that we're going through right now you know so I've got to remind myself I may beat my head against the wall but I do it at home so no one sees it <laughs> but I, I have tried to be calm because I know one thing about coaches is that your team will kind of take 
they they are looking at everything that you do, and the one thing that I've known is that they look at how you react to situations. And I'll give you a great example. When I was playing baseball, my college uh, days, I remember one specific play that I still lose sleep over sometimes. I wake up in a cold sweat, and this was 35 years ago, right, 40 years ago. And it was a double play ball that was hit to me. I'm playing second base, double play ball hit to me, runners at first and second. We turn a double play, the game's over, we win. And I remember throwing that ball, and I, I can see it sailing past the shortstop, down the left field line, into the bullpen, and watching the runners run the bases and scoring. My eyes went right to the dugout, and the guy that I was playing for at the time was trying to pull a bench out of cement. <laughs> you know, here's this grown man going, ah. and you know what, the next play, I wasn't saying, please hit the ball to me. It took me a while to kind of get over that, and it really made an impact in me because I know that my kids will look and see how I react to situations. And if you want them to be calm and have emotional stability, then you better have it too. Very good point. Stephanie, do you have another question for Coach? Oh, I could ask a thousand questions. Um, <laughs> okay, so one thing that we haven't really talked about, because I could ask you all kinds of drill questions, but I don't want to do that right now. Um, I kind of have a question about how how can I work and all these other teams out there work to gain their city's support through their Parks and Recs program. Um, my city doesn't offer girls competitive softball leagues, and so we struggle every year trying to find fields for them to practice on and facilities during you know indoor season. And it's really just kind of hard when you don't pay a Parks and Recs department money to reserve fields. So I didn't know if you have any advice on how all of us out there that their parents are already paying lots of money to play on the team without having to ask for more money to reserve fields. Yeah. Well, I wish I could help you on that because I've never, ever gone through that. I'm probably the worst guy to talk about that. But I think the one thing that you, you, you know, we all need to do is we all need to have ambassadors of our program. And a good example is I probably spend – more time thanking my grounds crew than I do anyone else. And the one thing that I found is little things, little thank yous to them, number one, make them feel like they're part of the team, but number two, whenever I need something, they'll run through a wall. So I would probably be a little bit political and, and try to find people in that community that maybe have some pull that can help you get to the city uh, and and maybe make some impacts in for young kids. Um, you know, there's also a lot of, there's some grants. Liberty Mutual has a grant that can kind of help a little bit, you know. So there's, there are ways, but it's really a, a tough thing, and that's why I always admire places that um, really do a lot for their kids. You know, you can always go into a city and you can kind of see how, you know, the, the emphasis they put on recreation. And you can tell cities that really don't. And unfortunately, when you're living somewhere and you don't have that help, um, the only thing that I know of is I'm going to try to find out who the shakers and movers are, and and try to try to convince them that we need to take care of our our kids, you know, and give them opportunities. But start small, and I think you're starting small right now, and hopefully you do a good job with that group. It'll start the word starts spreading, and you get more and more kids that are excited and and want to get involved in your program. So Coach chimed in there before I could also jump in, and I will say that the Liberty Mutual Insurance Responsible Sports Program does give out $37,500 every spring and fall in competition-based brands, so I would recommend getting started there at responsiblesports.com backslash brand. Uh, we also have a question from the ASA uh, Softball Facebook page. It comes from Tammy. And Coach, you mentioned uh, getting burned out earlier, and they're just wondering if there are any tall tale signs that their 10 or 11 year old who loves the sport of softball may be starting to feel a little burnt out uh, specializing in the sport? Well, I think, you know, people always ask, you know, how, how much should my, my daughter throw and, and, and this and that. And I think w when your daughter wants to throw is when she should throw. It's when you're forcing her out there to throw is when they start getting burned out. And so I think to the most part, um, I would listen to the kid and say, do you really want to play? You know, and if the kid says, no, I need a break, then give him a break. Sometimes we're scared to do that. I know for myself, even at this level, rest and recovery are a big part of our program. You know, you can't have kids going seven days a week, you know, all year round and not expect them to burn out a little bit. Um, so I think 
you know, your relationship with that kid, being able to talk to them and try to get their true feelings about, you know, how they feel about the game right now. Is the game getting the best of them or they're not looking forward to practice? Um, you know, they, their, their energy levels are down in practice. Those would be telltale signs for me that a kid probably is having some issues. And I think, you know, that's one of the things you've got to do. Um, you know, I always said men have to play good to feel good. Women have to feel good to play good. And one of my biggest things is making sure that a kid walks through those gates that I have a pretty good pulse on them and, and, and know whether they're there that day or not. I mean, it's, if you're around kids for a long time, you can pretty much tell when a kid is having problems. And in today's world, you can't take it lightly. You know, I, I had a kid last week that had a roommate that um, tried to commit suicide. Now, that's, I mean, that's a tough thing. And if, if you don't take care of that, she's not going to be any good for you on the field anyway. So I think the, the better your relationship with that player, the more information you can get from them and, and the more you can kind of take care of those situations. Thanks. Kenneth, do you have another question for Coach Andrea? Um, sure. Um, I, I, I mean, I coach my daughter in, in softball, and I do the other things with the, being the association president and stuff. But um, I have a son, too, and he plays soccer, and I coach him in soccer. And I've gone to coaching clinics for soccer, and they tend to stress a lot that um, – you need to be able to do any skill that you're trying to teach the players. And I can see that to an extent. Um, and so I, I guess, I mean, do you think that applies in softball or does that apply in general? And, and really my struggle is, why well, I think I can throw and, and field and, and catch reasonably well. This is uh, underhand pitching stuff sometimes has me a little beat. Well, one of the things you got to realize is if you're going to demonstrate something to your kids – you better make sure that it's a good demonstration because they're going to emulate what you do. And I see a lot of times uh, someone, well, there's a great commercial on TV about the dad and the son playing catch out. <laughs> this is the way you do it. And I mean, that kind of hit at home, you know, you, and that's why I really believe that if you're going to coach, then you have to become a student of the game and, and make sure that you understand what's right and what's wrong. You don't have to demonstrate, but you can have a lot of video and a lot of pictures that have great examples of the right way to do things, you know. But okay. I think it's always good that if, a, if I can get a parent, like in my camps, if I'm working with their daughter on hitting, I love having the parent sitting next to me and listening so that they will carry that over when they leave me. You know, otherwise you spend a week getting a kid to understand a certain skill, and then a week later they're gone, there's no carryover. And I think that's the big part of it, and that's why at the college level you can be more successful because you're, you've got those kids every day, you know, and it's a game of repetition. And so I think it's really important that you have good examples, and I think sometimes having parents at least have an understanding on what's right is probably good. Thanks. Okay. Ruben, you're up. Um, if you could turn your volume down just a little bit so that the feedback is uh, just a little bit less in there. And if you have another question for Coach, go ahead and uh, ask away. Are you there? I'm trying to get this volume down. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get my volume down. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Coach. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I guess uh, my next question will be, uh, uh, I, I really appreciate all these things you're saying. I happen to have my, my little girl here next to you. She's getting to hear a lot of this, which, which is good for her. Um, from a fitness standpoint, um, I, or, or l let me ask this question from, from a recruiting standpoint. Um, being that, you know, I, I know a lot of older girls also that, you know, they're, they're playing in the sport and they're trying to get their names out there. What do you feel is the is the best way for for a girl to get to I guess get noticed by by a coach like yourself or someone else? I mean, you got so many websites where they try to post highlights of themselves, and you know, I know I know stats and numbers count a lot, but you know, I know work ethic and just you know getting to know a person. You know, I bet I'm I'm betting you guys get tons and hundreds of videos from from kids, you know, asking to take a look at them, and, you know, and then you got to go to you know select tournaments. 
to try and get a look at what's the best what's the best thing a kid can do to stand out to get herself looked at by someone like yourself or you know another high, a high profile program if that's to try to, if that's the route that they're trying to take well I think it's um people don't want to hear it but it, this is the truth um, number one you know your kid has to continue to develop the skill set to be able to play at this level the second thing is you want to try to get them on a competitive team that is playing in competitive tournaments and I think um, for a lot of people they don't even know where those tournaments are you know there's there's certain tournaments that I go to that I promise you just about every division one school is there watching and recruiting so your daughter has a really good chance of being seen by someone if you are at that tournament if you're not ever going to those and you're gonna pay a lot of money to a service then if you're gonna pay a lot of money to a service I always tell people make sure you get a guarantee that they're gonna get you a scholarship and that's not gonna happen um, but number two I think there's really no easy path other than being good and playing on a good team and playing in competitive tournaments so the national tournaments are a big part and you got to think about it. We only have about a three-month window that we can actually be out and watch kids. So video and emails. I get probably 200 emails a day, and wow. videos are great because I can look at a video and I can at least see their skill set a little bit. And all that does is really um, get me excited about the kid to go out and watch them, or the other way, <laughs> kid can't play, right? But that's what videos can do. So when you're sending out emails or video, a couple things I would encourage you to do. Number one, make sure they always put uh, the year that they graduate in the heading so that you can look at that really quick. And then number two, um, I want information, um, you know, general information or academic information. But the big thing is the video clips should be nice and short. Don't let grandma and grandpa do it where their voice is in the background and it's 20 minutes long. I don't have 20 minutes to watch it but a nice two or three minute clip that shows you their basic skills of being able to to hit if they can pitch you know their what kind of pitches they throw but it's just all it's going to do is it's going to catch my eye to say I got to go out and see this kid she looks pretty yeah. darn good and so that's one way to to get that to happen but the tough thing is that you know most of the athletes at the division one level and elite programs come from elite travel ball teams around this country and I don't think anyone can argue with me about that so play ASA oh, yeah I agree it's, okay it's a nice plug make sure you got my oh you know you can't even see my shirt I got on but there there <laughs> ASA USA <laughs> Sharon do you have another question for coach yes it's actually a two-part question if that's okay okay sure. um what do you how do you teach girls to stay back on the ball so they're not lunging at it and also which position do you like them on the bases do you like the rock motion or do you like the on the like like a sprinter on the starter block okay well the first question was regarding trying to get kids to stay back um, there's one it, it 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 it's really muscle memory and it's really getting kids to understand what their body's doing because once you throw a ball at them, they're going to revert back to whatever they're used to doing. Um, I have these wedges. They're little devices. They're made out of metal, but they're a wedge. And basically what I'll do if I have a kid that lunges a lot is I'll put the wedge in their, right in front of their front foot and have them stride into the wedge. And by striding into that wedge, then they have a hard time of transferring their weight too early. That is... Um, You've got to really start with dry mechanics, um, and it's really about balance more than anything. You know, put them on a balance beam. That's another good way of getting them to feel that they're balanced. And I always say you always want to keep your head over your belly button. So if, if I'm going to lunge, there's no way that I'm keeping my head over my belly button, but I've got to get them to feel that. And so that's the one thing about drills. No matter what hitting drill that you do, it should create a feel. And so the feel that I'm trying to create with them is to to stay centered. I like to use the term centered instead of back, you know, but stay centered. I may use that, that wedge. Um, I may use a um, uh, little rubber 
plyo balls are kind of flat looking that they use in the weight room. Mm -hmm. Anything that they have to kind of stride into that won't allow them to get their weight forward too much. Because ultimately, we want our weight forward a little bit as we stride. We don't want everything back. Okay. And if you think about throwing, and that's another good drill, is, you know, get them to put a ball in their hand, get them in their hitting position, and have them just throw a ball sidearm. And you'll notice that a lot of times their throwing motion will look a lot different than when they put a bat in their hand. So okay. trying to get them to identify this is what it feels like and this is the position I want. Now let's try to find some drill that will help them create that feel. And once they do that about 10,000 times, then you might get them to be able to correct that. It's not an easy fix, but there's not many easy fixes when it comes to hitting. And the second part about the starting position or the base running? Starting position, base running, um, and this, this kind of leads into that, but if you really want, if you're working with a youth team and you really want to spend your time on something that you can improve your team a bunch, spend it on base running more so than hitting because hitting takes forever. Okay? Number one, you have to have good knowledge to be able to teach it. But number two, base running, anyone can be a good base runner. And we do both. We have some kids that use the rocker. We have some kids that are in front of the bag. A lot will depend. Our quicker kids, we like to use the rocker because it allows them to cheat a little bit. Okay? Yeah. Um, our, our kids that aren't really base dealers, we put them in front of the bag because they're a step closer to second. You know, but the whole key to base running is you have to make sure that those leads are controlled because if they're not stealing, they have to be able to go two ways. And too many times I see kids trying to go really hard off first base and stop, and then the ball's hit and they start again. You know, we want them to kind of be in continuous motion so that when they read the ball, they can cross over and go so you see no hesitation. So it's an art, and it takes a lot of time, but um, that's a good question. I think it's more uh, personal preference than anything else. Okay. Stephanie, you're up next. Do you have a question for Coach? I know really? you've got thousands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um... Since we're such a new organization and this is, you know, brand new competitive coaching for a lot of our coaches, they're doing an excellent job and I'm so proud of them. But I know as a female how to relate to female athletes, that I have a lot of male coaches who struggle with that a little bit. And it's not that they're not trying because I know they are, but I can hear things that they say or the approach that they take that I'm like, yeah, we might need to go about that a little bit different. How do I instruct them or mentor them so that they can be successful talking to preteen girls? <laughs> well, it's just like um, I think any staff, um, you know, there's got to be someone that's going to kind of spread the good news and say this is the way we're going to do things. So I think one of the first things that I would do is I would look at having some um, – coaches clinics or whatever it may be where you can bring up some of these topics and talk about it um, and then maybe give some scenarios out okay here's a scenario how would you handle this you know a lot of times you know everyone handles things a little bit differently um, but I think the biggest thing is you know you always have to put the feelings first in front of the female athlete because once once you ruin that then you're really gonna have an uphill climb to try to get anything out of them. And I, I really think, you know, there's some athletes that I have that I can, they love me to yell at them because they've been brought up that way, you know. So some of it is kind of finding out what their background is, but the other is finding out how they want to be treated, you know. And I think you treat everyone the way you want to be treated, and I don't think you have to be a yeller to be a great coach. Um, you have to be a good communicator. And so I think the one thing that I would do is get my staff together or my coaches together, and I would make that a part of my training. Because I think a lot of people don't do that in leagues. You know, if I have a league, then I would want all of my coaches to pretty much have an understanding on, on the fundamentals and how we're going to teach them. You know, I think everyone would love that. You know, here are some drills that work, and this is how we set up a practice. You, you can kind of – fluctuate from that and kind of do your own thing but here's some things that we have to be able to do and I think when it comes to the emotional side of the game or the mental side of the game I think little discussions about that on a weekly basis can be very helpful great so, education thanks I think we have time for one more round of questions so we'll uh, get back started with Ken 
Well, I actually I was trying to decide what I was going to ask you, but since you pointed it out, um, you know, one of the things that I, I guess I've always kind of been challenged with a little bit is exactly how to structure a practice to be most efficient or most useful. Um, you, you know, I, I feel like sometimes the girls go out there, they start throwing the ball, and it, I, I go back and forth between structured ones and unstructured ones, and I don't really always have a good sense of what I'm doing. I mean, what kind of insights could you give me there? Well, I'll kind of give you what I use, um, and I've, I've really been using this for a long time. Um, you know, the first part of our practice is a, a warm-up, uh, an active warm-up, um, which I think is very important for for kids to understand that you do have to warm things up a little bit before you um, start playing. Um, and then the second part of my practice is a throwing warm-up. And I call it a throwing warm-up because there are certain – things that we do during that warm-up period. Uh, we long toss every day. Um, we do a lot of ball and glove drills. But the biggest thing is for me as a coach, it's a great opportunity for me to teach throwing. How many times do you see people warming up and the coaches are sitting in the dugout, you know, kind of doing their thing, and they're really not coaching during that warm-up period? So I think, again, you have to kind of have a structure of this is how we're going to warm up. You know, this is how we're going to start. We're going to start 15 feet away. We may do some wrist flips or whatever it may be. Then we may do some stride, side straddle work. And then we're going to long toss every day. And then we're going to do some ball and glove drills to kind of put the feet and the throw together. And the next part of my practice every day is fundamentals. It's um, defensive drill work. So that's when we're doing ground ball work and fly ball work. But we're rolling ground balls. You know, we're hitting ground balls. Um, we're receiving throws. Um, all the things that you have to do, all the little skill sets that are important, we do on a daily basis for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then after that, I always take one part of our defense and we bring the team together. Now we're going to do team defense. So we may work on cutoffs and relays. We may work on pop-up communication. We may work on first and third defense. Um, you know, we have something – every week that we do that it brings the team together and then we take one aspect of our offense so what kind of offense do i want i want an aggressive offense so we do a lot of bunting a lot of slap and runs etc well those are things that you can incorporate in drill work so that kids can get some repetition so that when you call that sign in a game they've done it a million times okay fake bunt steal whatever it may be and then we hit every day. We have batting practice every day, and I usually hit in three groups. I have one group hitting live on the field and um, doing base running. I have another group on defense at their position taking balls live off the bat. And then I have another group in the cages doing their cage work. And then we rotate them. And usually we go about three rounds of six cuts on the field um, and um, three rounds of that, and then we rotate groups. But that's kind of my standard template of what a practice is going to look like. And I will vary it from time to time, like today. You know, today I got them together and we did some, some outfield work. And then I had them play a game called 21. And all it is is really, I, you know, I had a defense out there. I had some base runners. And I was hitting fungos. But I, I was, I was, we're going to play 21 outs. So we played game-like, you know, and I can kind of control it. You know, so I got it down to where, you know, now it's the base is loaded, two outs, you know, and, and then I will maybe hit a ground ball to someone to get a force to, to end the game. But that's a great way to teach the game and how to play the game, um, especially defensively. You know, I think that's one thing we don't do enough of is breaking down our sport. Um, and you don't need the whole field. Like sometimes if I'm working pop-up communication, I may just work the right side of the field. So I may have the first baseman, the second baseman, and the right fielders. And then I'll hit balls between that, that triangle and teach them how to communicate. Then I may do uh, the second baseman, the shortstop, and the center fielder. Or the shortstop, the third baseman, and the left fielder. And then some days I may do the entire field. So there's a lot of ways you can break it down. And that's something I think basketball coaches do a great job of is they take their offense and they break it down into smaller parts. And I never scared to do that in, in the game of softball also because of the numbers. Great insight. Ruben, do you have another question for Coach? Yeah. 
a lot of good information. Thanks a lot, Coach. Yeah. But from from a fitness standpoint, um, how much do you, well, you know? Of course, when these girls are getting older, getting ready to college, if, if they are able to make that leap, uh, how much fitness do you think they should put into their training regimen? Just you know, just just to be. How much do you guys work on that? Well, the one thing that I would suggest, number one, um, for kids, I would not worry about weights until they're done growing and their growth plates are closed. And I would let leave that up to the college coach, okay? Because you can probably do more harm than good. You can do a lot of stuff with their body weight. So I really believe that for me to help a kid, I want to work on their their quickness because the game that we play is all about first steps. So agility work, you know, ladder drills, um, you know, anything that you can work on to work on explosion and first steps doesn't have to be complicated. But they have to have some level of endurance, uh, you know, to kind of do all this stuff. But my big thing is I want them explosive and I want them quick. And the other thing is I want them to be able to have a good, strong grip. Because the one thing about our game, the game's played from the elbows down. The kids that have a strong grip, and we test our kids with grip strength, the stronger the grip, the harder they can throw, the quicker their bat is. Okay? So Thank if that's you. the case, I can do little things to help them gain more strength in their hands, which is going to definitely help them offensively and defensively. But body weight is huge, and there's so many good things out today on YouTube that you can get on and, and look at different agility drills. But I think agility and quickness is the one thing that I'm looking for all the time. Once they get to college, then we definitely we lift three days a week in the fall, two days a week in the spring. We condition five days a week. Um, it's a big part of our program because we want to try to get kids to be strong, but we're not trying to make them look like weightlifters either. You, know, you have to no, have yeah. good flexibility. No, you. you have to have good flexibility, okay? But the biggest thing is we want to keep them healthy. You know, throwing sports, one of the biggest thing about our sport is everything that we do, if I'm right-handed, and that's why I have sciatic nerve problems sometimes because everything I've done in my life has been rotational. You think about it. So one thing that you can do to help kids is to work on their rotation, their core muscles and rotational stuff, because that's going to also help them stay healthy. Great. I got a zipper on my elbow, and that's, you know, that's from probably um, doing some crazy things when I was a little eager. Don't <laughs> <laughs> throw that curveball too early. It was a good curveball, though. <laughs> Sharon, do you have another question? Yes. Um, how do you deal with communication? Uh, sometimes the girls on my team are on the field. They can talk in between breaks and everything, but as soon as they get on the field, they hardly ever talk yeah. to each other. And well, then I don't know how to make them speak a little bit more on the field as they do when they're taking their water break or whatnot. <laughs> well, you have to have um, – probably you have to build a dialogue because um, communication on the field, you know – you're not looking at the rah-rah type communication. You're looking at constructive communication um, to play defense. And so first thing you got to do is you got to have your list of how are you going to communicate. What do you expect your kids to communicate? For instance, if i got a right fielder throwing a ball to home plate and I've got a first baseman that's a cutoff, there's certain things that mean something to us. Okay? And everyone says the same thing. Same thing like on pop-up communication. There's, you know, I don't have someone say, I got it, I got it. Someone says, ball, ball, ball. Someone says, you know, you, you, you. I mean, there's one standard thing that we use. And so I think for you as a coach, you got to kind of develop your vocabulary of, of, of what communication is all about. And then you have to demand them communicating because it's a big part of playing defense. You can't play defense if you can't communicate. You know, how many times you see that second baseman trying to cover first base on a bunt, and they quite they can't quite get to first base, but do they ever say anything to that person that's throwing the ball, like, you know, hit me, hit me, hit me, or lead me, lead me, lead me? You know, to me, that means something to our kids when they hear that. So that's 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 a challenge, even at this level, you know, but it's something that you got to continue to ask them to do. And, um, yeah, when they get in their circle and they're stretching, they'll talk like crazy. Yeah. They get on the field and they – Put the mute button on. <laughs> Stephanie, do you have another question? Okay, so I know my other coaches sent me this text and said, please ask him how to increase bat speed and power 
are in young kids who haven't fully developed yet. Okay. Well, believe it or not, I think the only way that you you can increase some bat speed, it's um, a lot of it's God-given talent. Okay, so the, your genetics has a part of it, but believe it or not, swinging a lighter implement will increase your ability to move your hands faster. So guess what? Most young kids at my age, back in the day, of course we only had black and white TVs, we didn't have all this other <laughs> stuff, so we played a lot of wiffle ball. And believe it or not, you know, swinging a wiffle ball bat and playing wiffle ball actually helped increase bat speed. You know, so there's there's a lot of things that you can do, um, but most of the time, if you take your normal bat weight and you are swinging something that's anywhere from three to five ounces lighter, it will definitely help increase your ability to make your hands quicker. Heavy bats, on the other hand, um, are going to slow you down. You know, heavy bats will give you the feeling that your bat's quicker, but it's really just the feeling. So light, light, light. You think about golf today, and they've been able to make drivers that are um, very sturdy and hard, but the one thing they've been able to do is lighten everything. They lighten the shafts, they lighten the head, so that what? People can swing it faster. And by swinging it faster, they get more distance. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Uh Liberty Mutual Insurance Responsible Sports wants to thank everyone at home watching on YouTube. We want to thank our special guests here chatting with us live, and we also want to give a special thanks to Coach Candrea for taking your time out today and speaking with us. It has been my pleasure, and uh, I'll leave you with one thing for all of you. You know, coaches have a tendency to spend a lot of time with other people's kids, and I had a son and a daughter. My daughter quit playing softball after eighth grade because she never thought she'd be good enough. My son was the one that kind of woke me up Back in 94, I was coaching the national team in St. John's, Newfoundland, came back from a three-week three, uh, three week trip, walked in the house. He said, Dad, can we talk? He didn't say, welcome home. And so, man, my ears perked up and a sophomore in high school, and he said, Dad, would you consider dropping out of the USA coaching pool so that you can watch me play baseball? And that hit me with a ton of bricks and made me realize that sometimes we do all this stuff, we kind of get out of balance. So... I urge you all to make sure you have balance in your life between your family, your profession. We all need spiritual help, and uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that. But to me, that's what it's all about. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Coach. Thank, thank you. you. We also want to thank ASA Softball for helping us set this up. If you want to learn more, visit asasoftball.com. Uh, also, be sure to visit responsiblesports.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash responsiblesports. And we're also now on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is JoinTeamRS. So until next time, thanks for joining in, guys. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.